Hello, everybody. Welcome. Nice to see your faces again. I know we saw some of you earlier today. Thank you for your participation in Ken Pienta's Q&A session. And thank you for joining today if you are here for the first time for Jim Shapiro's Q&A session. Um, we are so happy. This is the second to last Q&A session. So I hope you all get all of your questions ready. Um, I'm just here to make sure that everything runs smoothly. And if you have any questions that you cannot come off of mute to ask, I'm here to read them from the chat as well. So I will turn it over to Jim. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Tana. Um, Tana asked me to give a short summary of what I was talking about uh, at the uh, symposium. And the point of, of my remarks was to say that cancer cells, uh, but all eukaryotic cells have these built-in uh, systems which allow them to rearrange and change their genomes and do it in ways that we uh, almost never imagined were possible. And the phenomena like chromothripsis and chromoplexy and uh, what happens with micronuclei and uh, polyploid giant uh, cancer cells uh, are, are telling us that something very uh, interesting and very powerful in the ability of, of uh, the cancer cells to change themselves is going on. And the other uh, point I wanted to make about that was that this is something that's very deep in evolutionary history of eukaryotes because the same processes go on in plants and they grow on in, in unicellular uh, uh, eukaryotic organisms. So the, the ability to change rapidly is important and it's important for evolution, but uh, we see in cancer how quickly it can happen. And certainly uh, cancer is evolution within a lifetime and one doesn't need thousands of, of, of years or eons for major changes to take place. And, and I think that's the point of, of Henry Hang's book as well. And um, that's what I was trying to get across. And I hope it, it came through. Maybe one other point I should make is that I, I tried to point out that there, I, I was describing at least two distinct systems uh, one being the uh, one which happens at, during the, the mitosis, during uh, separation of cells, daughter cells, is the chromothripsis process, which you, we saw a video of. And another uh, uh, process, which is quite distinct, but also very interesting, is chromoplexy, where a small set of chromosomes trade uh, DNA back and forth. And... Uh, those are only two of, of a, a number of, of different um, routines, let's say, that eukaryotic cells have to change their genomes when they get uh, in trouble. And uh, I think we have to understand how that works in, in cancer and it may give us some opportunities for, for dealing with cancer if we can figure out how to prevent those changes from taking place at key points in, the, in, in treatment. Thank you, that's perfect. Well, would anyone like to start with a question? I have a, one question, Jim. <laughs> Appreciate your talk. And uh, so you actually, uh, you, you mentioned that have a difference, a major difference between the uh, Leo Darwinian. So you, you mentioned one is the active selection versus the passive selection. One is a macro and a micro evolution, and one is uh, uh, how the inheritance pass, and also uh, uh, each construction all of this. So, according to your experience, which aspect is the most difficult to exchange the idea for the, with the Leo Darwinian? I mean, the, 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 I mean, along the so which one is the most the, the get angry about, for example? Well, I, I, it's very difficult to talk to uh, uh, neo-Darwinians. They're a bit like um, 
um, uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to think of the right term to use. Uh, religious uh, uh, extremists who don't want to change anything, and even if you point out to them the evidence for things like mobile genetic elements, which were never conceived until Barbara McClintock discovered them in the late 1940s. And even then, they weren't accepted for many, many years until they were rediscovered in, in other organisms, in, in, especially in bacteria. Um, they, they don't want to listen to any of these things which are different from, from their uh, 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 belief system, which was uh, developed in the first half of the 20th century before we knew about DNA. And they want to interpret DNA as simply the uh, explanation for all that they've been saying all along. Even though we know that now that we can sequence DNA and look at genomes and compare them and see what's actually happened in evolution, that uh, many different kinds of processes have gone on from the ones that were conceived uh, by Darwin in 1859 or by the neo-Darwinists in the 1940s. Um, and even uh, conventional evolutionary theory updated today uh, doesn't take a lot of these processes into account. Uh, they don't realize how major they've been in, in evolutionary uh, history. Did that answer your question, Henry? Yes, I, but I still, you know, just to try to you know, figured out how, because every time if you bring up this uh, difference, and people always say, we know that, you know, the, the, so the, it's, it's not a surprise. So they always say that, but from the way of thinking, the appeal is not knowing that. For example, in the cancer field, we have, uh, since uh, 20 06, 07, we start to have the different type of thinking tech meeting in the NCI and the evolutionary meeting almost, uh, you know, every two years. So we have the meeting talking about. But if you bring up this issue, people always say, we know that. But uh, what the study is that it clearly doesn't know because they still focus on like, like, you know, the people study the gene, you know, evolution in cancer. They still try to find the step, they try to find the trunk mutation or the mutation involvement. So there's still very much, you know, linear progression of the clonal expansion, even though the fact is not like that. But if you discuss the theory, they always say, we know that. We know that what are you talking about? Well, they, 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 they don't deny the phenomena but they don't see where the phenomena are inconsistent with the way they have been explaining things. And uh, they don't want to accept that they have to start changing the way they're thinking. Most people are actually very reluctant to change the way they think. Fundamentalists, that's the word I was looking for. They're like religious fundamentalists. And um, uh, we heard this morning from Ken how this affects uh, the study sections in giving grants to people who research cancer. And we saw at the meeting how uh, useful thinking about punctuated evolution of cancer can be in designing treatment modalities. So uh, I think it's, a, it's actually a serious practical problem that um, the most people uh, involved in making decisions about funding research, for example, still believe that neo-Darwinism is the way evolution happens. And the, all the things that we've learned through genomics and, and molecular biology uh, and other, other kinds of research don't, uh, don't matter, but they do matter. Yeah. I could add a few comments to what Jim has just said. Um, Henry, we were told exactly the same thing. That is, we know all this, and we've known it for a long time, at the meeting on new trends in evolutionary biology four years ago, held in London. 
subsequently published in Interface Focus. And at that time, I certainly wasn't at all sure what they meant. When we started producing, therefore, the detailed evidence of discoveries over the last, well, many decades now, because as Jim just said, it, it goes all the way back to the uh, first half of the 20th century. When we started to list all the discoveries that we think are outside the remit of the modern synthesis, you end up with a list of about 40. You, you'll find them on the slides that uh, Jim presented at that part of the symposium. So more recently, we did an analysis of five of the most common textbooks and popular books on evolutionary biology, including Futuma's extremely widely used textbook simply called Evolution, published by Oxford University Press, Jerry Coyne's book, Why Evolution is True. Uh, I can't remember which press published that. I think it may also have been Oxford University Press, incidentally, but that's just uh, um, my memory not being certain. And then we looked carefully through three of the major books by Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene, The Extended Phenotype, and was the, and yes, was The Blind Watchmaker. Now, what you find is very, very striking. If you count up the number of clear, positive uh, recognitions of those 40 discoveries in the Futuma and Fitzpatrick textbook, you'll find two out of the 40. That's all you'll find. And one of them is not even attributed to the right person. The issue of symbiogenesis, which has been so ably championed until she passed away by Lynn Margulis, um, does not name Lynn Margulis by name. She's hidden somewhere deep in the uh, reference list. No reader, no student reader of the textbook would realize who actually uh, did the work required to show that that process had occurred. And it's one of the most important steps in the evolutionary process. Um, that's the Futuma book. The coin book has none of them, absolutely not a single one of the 38 or 40 um, items that we identified are referred to. The Dawkins book, a little bit better, he does at least openly recognize the contributions of Lynn Margulis on symbiogenesis. But even so, it's when you add it up, it's only about two out of the 40 that are recognized. So the fact is that what we were told four years ago, which is exactly what you've been told, Henry, which is that we know all of this already, is not actually properly analyzed and discussed in any of the textbooks that most students are using, and more importantly, I think, that the great majority of the public will read, which will be texts like Jerry Coyne and Richard Dawkins. So there is a very, very serious, I don't know what to call it, it's almost a kind of denial that any of this really matters, even though they will say that we know it all already. I don't understand it. I think what Jim has characterized as almost like an act of faith um, is not a bad way uh, of describing it. But I want then to say one other thing, which I think is important in relation to some of the other question and answer discussions that have been going on in the meeting and after the meeting, which is this. I find, I lecture all over the world to absolutely tens of thousands of people at big uh, congresses and so on, on these issues. And I hardly ever find a hard neo-Darwinist. I don't think there are any, many of them left. They happen to be in extremely important positions of great influence, 
But when you ask most physiologists, most biochemists, most medical scientists generally, and most biologists generally, what do you understand by neo-Darwinism? What they will say, well, it's just Darwin updated, isn't it? And it can be anything. It doesn't actually, in their minds, carry the original weight that the modern synthesists put on their restriction of what it was that Darwin originally conceived as the evolutionary multifaceted, one has to emphasize, uh, evolutionary process. So it is, it's, it's important to pin all of this down because those discoveries, the 40 or so that we've referred to, are part of what is needed to understand what lessons evolutionary biology, as interpreted by those who are prepared to uh, update it or even replace it, um, it's important for what that can give to the study uh, of the development of cancer. If we don't get that right, we will still be misled. That's how serious it is. Yeah, well, it, it, it's actually not the specialists in evolution that are the problem. It's the, it, on, the, on the cancer study sections at the NIH, it's going to be cancer biologists who assume that the, the modern synthesis is the last word in evolutionary biology and are going to be suspicious of anybody who comes up and says, well, evolution doesn't work that way and we're going to try and look for this in cancer. Um, and they, they take it as a given that that's, that's, that's the way things are. And uh, it's, it's very hard to get the word out that uh, Cancer uh, evolution doesn't work that way. So, so uh, I, you know, for uh, from our own experience, maybe uh, they have some inform information about it. So initially, when we did the watch evolution action experiment, we fully anticipate we should see the stable, like the chromal expect expansion, right? As as, as like the. Peter Lowell, they all pre projected. So, and people know if you culture the cell, if culture non high, so they have some change. But the people never anticipate you just a short time and the drastic change. I said that is a very surprise. So, when we initially found this, we discussed with many people. So, we first reaction we thought maybe our experiment was wrong because how could the semantic evolution, you know, it, is the pattern of is, is, is wrong. So we actually discussed with ma many people, it's about 20 years ago, majority of the cancer research told me, all this big uh, candy member, all this, don't talk about evolution, have nothing to do with cancer, right? So that's uh, about 20 years ago. And then now with this few years, everyone, this is, all the, even physicians that just say, Oh, so complicated, it must be evolution. So that's the, so the second wave of this one, right? But then you, you listen to some of our colleagues to give a lecture for the physician, but they always give the, the, the lecture, the always two parts. The first part, they always tell people, oh, it's very unpredictable, so much change, highly heterogeneity, we cannot do that. And then in the second part, they always shift the gear, tell people, Fortunately, we found a few target. It's working very well. So all the paper, just like that. That is the first part, they say this evolution is cannot handle. And the second part, they're always very lucky they found the target, right? So, so that is all the similar you go. So they actually misuse the information of evolution as such. So, so that's a challenge, you know, how should, how, how can we tell people. But according to my experience, I discussed with about at least a few hundred people, but in private, they all agree the evolution thinking near that one had a problem. But they refuse to acknowledge this in public. So well it's like because the 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 the, the neo Darwinists will object like they objected to Dennis's meeting 
in London in 2016. They tried to stop it. They don't want people to say the emperor has no clothes and that you have to think about evolution in a different way. I mean, Darwin himself in, in the sixth edition of Origin of Species talked about other forms of rapid change. And he says, I, I, I uh, previously under, underestimated the importance of this in, yeah. in evolution. And even when uh, uh, people who are accepted in, 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 uh, 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 as mainstream uh, leading scientists like Ledger Sevens, who discovered uh, what he calls uh, cataclysmic evolution by interspecific hybridization, uh, it doesn't enter into the mainstream. I, I wonder if Stebbins is, is cited in uh, Coyne's book. I don't know if you looked that one up, Dennis, but um, he, he, was a, he was a mainstream evolutionist, but he found that when you cross two different species, you often got a third species and you got it within a, a generation or two. Send so me that were, detail, Jim, and I will check in Coyne's book. Then we can add it to the slide. Right. Yes. And uh, so I think that it, it's, 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 a, it's a, uh, a dogma, if you will, which, um, which has been uh, has solidified and people don't want to change it. It's interesting because the way Dennis and I met originally was I wrote a paper on the central dogma by Crick. And I thought dogma was a very strange term to use in science because you shouldn't have dogmas um, and try to show ways that, that um, um, cells change their DNA and that that didn't fit with the central dogma. And um, I think people have this idea that they, they understand all of the whole process and we can explain it all, and we don't need anything new. But we're continually discovering things that we didn't know about. So I also have a question uh, to, to Jim and uh, to Dennis. Also. So we're talking about active evolutionary selection. So what's the degree of the activity can, can be achieved? So for example, so we know that under stress, any condition, the switch to the you know, chaotic genome or reshuffling program. But this also subject to seriously, you know, selection because, uh, uh, for example, the uh, chrome suppressors, people found they only have few percentage, but according to our experiment, you can induce much, much higher percentage. However, most of them cannot survive, therefore be washed out. So, so we know, like even Germini, you know, the subsomatic cell have some vesicle go to Germini, but the overall structure is still maintained as a cold genome. So, so the question is, how active? We know it's active evolution evolved, but how active? The degree or scale? How, you know, is there? So, what's what, what's the opinion of, you know, any of you? Do you want to go first, Jim? Oh, yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, I, 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 uh, after after reading about uh, uh, chromothripsis and some of the other uh, uh, massive changes that take place in cancer, um, it's hard to see any limit to what can happen. Um, cells can can make dozens or hundreds of changes in their genomes, and they do in cancer. We know that. Uh, because we, we, we've got the genomes and we can see that. So um, I think that capacity to change uh, oneself is uh, central. It's certainly central to evolution because without that, things can't evolve. And it's also central to cancer because without that, that ability, cancer cells can't establish themselves and then survive. Uh, uh, chemotherapy and, and acquire metastasis and so forth. And uh, it's um, a, a, once we recognize those capabilities to change their own heredity uh, in cancer cells, I think we'll be in a better position to deal with them. 
and uh, to treat them. And certainly one of the main things that I got out of the meeting uh, was that it's, it's not a good idea to try and kill off a cancer ra rapidly. You want to really treat it and keep it under control and don't give it a chance to change into something that's much more dangerous for, for your health and survival. Yes, that, that's one of the key insights that I think has come from this meeting, which would not, it seems to me, have come without turning the neo-Darwinist argument about the role of stochasticity upside down. Because the, the insight that the very treatment, although it may kill many of the cells in the cancer, will also, though, be provoking the very changes that cells can uh, actively undergo um, and in that process develop into a much more dangerous form uh, of uh, cancer. That is an insight that I don't think you would get from the modern synthesis. On the modern synthesis, you would have to be waiting until, by sheer chance, those particular mutations turn up. And what is obviously very clear is that cells don't do that. What they do when they're in difficulty is to either hypermutate, rearrange, uh, or reorganize the karyotype or the genome in many, many ways. And that's the big change. Um, and I think what this meeting has got to do and what it has to do in its subsequent publication is just to patiently explain that there are many predictions and directions of research that wouldn't be thought important if we just stuck uh, with the modern synthesis view. But then I've got another thing I want to add in response to your question, Henry, um, active. I think there might have to be a distinction here between two kinds of organisms being active. Um, now, the reason for that, and again, forgive the little bit of history, um, Charles Darwin himself did something very interesting between his 1859 Origin of Species and his 1871 book in which he introduced the concept of sexual selection, which is a form of social selection. He actually specifically refers to the conscious intention of organisms to choose the most beautiful mate. And as he points out, that does exactly the same thing as breeders, human breeders, of different varieties of dogs, cats, fish, plants, and so on, are doing. That is choosing the characteristics that they wish for. That is clearly, and in Darwin's view, intentional um, action on the part of the organism. Incidentally, Julian Huxley's The Modern Synthesis, published in 1942, does not even recognize Darwin's uh, idea of sexual selection. It's not there in the book at all. Now I come to the important point. Clearly, many of these active processes go on without us, as it were, as complete organisms, being aware in that sense so I think one's got to draw a distinction very carefully between the processes that Darwin originally identified as the alternative to natural selection, which is the intentional uh, change by an organism selecting uh, a pretty mate or whatever it might be, socially cooperating, and the processes that occur in our bodies, which occur without us being aware of them, we're clearly not aware of our immune system doing what it does to somehow actively look for uh, a fit to the invading virus, bacterium, or whatever it might be. So I think there's an important distinction there also to be drawn. So uh, to follow up that question, because uh, I remember the uh, Richard Dawkins, I always say 
he said that he favor of his uh, Darwin, the book is a first edition. He said because the first edition is so different from the gradually progression, right? So for the theory, I always think we should not read the first uh, edition for this person, but rather the, the last edition <laughs> about anyone, because the, actually the, the theory for them is gradually evolved in such a way. So you're talking about, uh, he emphasized the, the, the intention of the being, is this the, uh, is the first edition or is later on, so it's just curious. Yes, see, Darwin's own ideas clearly evolved. I think any good historian of science will um, admit that, not only admit, but many of them, of course, have, have probably studied it. I mean, just to give one example, which is extraordinary, um, I was in contact with one of the Third Way members, Dick Vane Wright, who is a biologist who worked for many years at the Natural History Museum in London and was therefore responsible for many of the major collections that have been accumulated by the Natural History Museum. And I happened to tell him that I had found that even Lamarck, who is often thought to be, and wrongly thought to be, the precise opposite of Darwin, um, had actually drawn a tree of life some 28 years before Darwin's notebook, Tree of Life, in the 1830s. And I asked Dick Vane Wright, did he know about this as a, a historian of science and a very distinguished uh, taxologist? And he said, the evolutionary biologists don't know about it, but we historians have been writing about this for years and years and years. And he gave me then six detailed references on why Lamarck's discovery of the tree of life was so important. Now, what I think I'm saying here is that there's a big difference, it seems to me, between the knowledge, perhaps this is not surprising, of the knowledge of the history of evolution by the professional historians of evolution, Dick Vane Wright is just one example of that, and the active biologists, I say not surprising because most of us very active in research don't have the time to go and read all, all the history. But what I think has happened therefore progressively and the modern synthesis epitomizes this to an enormous degree, but it's happened generally, is that there is a kind of forgetting process in the busy activity of science, which leads to the fact that many things are simply forgotten. Ask a general audience of biologists how many people know that Darwin was also a Lamarckian. How many people know that he favored active involvement of organisms in the direction of their uh, evolution? And you'll find hardly anybody put a, a hand up. That's interesting, yeah. We invite, if anybody has any pressing questions, um, feel free if you would like to take yourself off of, oh, we've got a question from Paul. Yeah. Paul says, what do you, what did you think about Azra Raz's answer to your question about polyploid cells? That 40% of cancer patients don't have any polyploid cells, meaning that 60% of cancer patients do. Does her answer make you feel that polyploid cells are always present? In other words, that in those 40% of cases that she mentioned, the polyploid cells were undetected? Well, that's always a possibility that they were undetected and we don't know because by the time we examine a cancer, it's typically very far along in the, in the evolutionary process already. So we don't know if polyploid cells were present before that. Um, but the other thing is that not every cancer has to evolve in the same way. So some may use polyploid cells, some may not. Uh, we know that uh, genomes can be massively rearranged without polyploidy. But that's one of the important ways that they, they do get rearranged. And um, from uh, what Ken 
Jenta told us uh, at the meeting and this morning, uh, you get stages where uh, you're treating uh, cancer and all you see are giant cells. So I think polyploidy is important, but it's not necessarily universal. I, I, I hope that answers the question. Go ahead, Ken. So, um, um... I actually think that um, that polyploidy as a, as a again a, a cell state transition does exist in in all cancer patients or the vast majority of them, and that you can actually um, if you look for them in the right way um, uh, because they're very difficult on standard pathology just H and E sections to see. But if you stain for a cell periphery um, and then look for an, and it with a nuclear stain, you'll find that they're they're present. They're not the majority of cells. Um, in fact, if they are the majority of cells, uh, you you tend to die very quickly. The the Hopkins people published in Prostate Cancer, uh, you know that if you had a giant quote unquote giant cell variant of prostate cancer your median survival was one year instead of 15 to 20. So um, if, if you're unlucky enough to have a variant like that, you're, you're not gonna do well. Uh, but I, I do think the, the, the fact that if you look for them with the right technique, you're going to find them as a, uh, a cell state transition that you know, obviously we think is critical to, to the cancer lethal cancer phenotype. Um, so um, that's, that's my take on it. I, th I think it, it, it speaks to the need to think in a more evolutionary way about diagnostics. Because I, I, yeah, I agree with that um, completely. And um, I also, uh, you know, going back to um, uh, to uh, this morning, Dennis's, you know, comment that, um, you know, we don't know how to find the first cell. We also don't know how to find, quote unquote, important cells and um, how are we going to find them in all the noise of single cell techniques? Um, how are we going to, you know, come up with some type of platform uh, that allows us to indirectly see those, in whatever the lethal cell type is? is something that is currently uh, beyond us, uh, uh, even for uh, Lee Hood. <laughs> so yeah. Well, actually, actually uh, and there may not just be a cell, which is the key. It may be a, a population of cells because tumors become heterogene heterogeneous as they become more dangerous, as I understand it. Depends on the cloud. <laughs> Sorry. Go yes, ahead. That's I'm incidentally, sorry. one of the reasons why I um, was influential in bringing Scott Bonner into the meeting with the very clear evidence that the extracellular vesicles are conveying information from cancerous cells that is, first of all, different from the information that would come, that is, the set of RNAs, DNAs, other molecules found in the extracellular vesicles, which itself gives you conceivably, whenever it might be possible to get suitable diagnostics for that, a, a reasonably sensitive test to whether cancerous cells are pouring out such vesicles. You ought to be able to detect that even just in a blood sample. The other thing, though, that, that he showed that I think is very important, too, is that cancer cells seem to have a way of putting out extracellular vesicles with sticky proteins that enable a kind of pathway for metastasis to occur. Now, if that is also true, then those sticky proteins could be a clue. In other words, I think we, we're beginning to see possible early clues that might be followed up. So to the question, could we try to look for what Azra is asking us to look for, which is the early markers, there's at least two possible ways in which early marking may emerge. 
it's far too early to know, but I'd love to know how you all react to that. Um, this is Ken. I I, um, I love uh, extracellular vesicles, um, and uh, we uh, we we're doing a lot of work on on them um, to think about them, uh, both for their biology uh, as well as uh, whether they can be good biomarkers. And I have no uh, no question uh, that uh, you know that different cell types package uh, information into those EVs. And we will, uh, I think there's already good work saying that as we get smarter about looking at, at, that, uh, at the contents of those, that they are going to you know, be another complementary uh, biomarker for detecting early disease. Um, and we're certainly uh, you know, thinking about that hard. Um, I've been fascinated, though, by, uh, you know, the, this idea about, you know, it seems to me that um, EVs are um, basically, um, uh, first and foremost, a, a, a way to, for cells to get rid of their garbage. And, um, and, and certainly in getting rid of their garbage, they're reflecting what's happening inside the cell, what metabolism is changing, why are they putting out those particular sticky proteins? Um, because um, it, it would be, from an evolutionary standpoint, very difficult to believe they're getting some kind of, uh, certainly information back from a pre-metastatic niche. I have a lot of trouble with that concept, but I also understand that cells uh, that do take up that garbage uh, can be selected for and because they may have some advantage. And I think it's a fascinating uh, question. Um, what's the feedback mechanism, if any, that could allow that kind of uh, information flow to happen? Um, you know, uh, and one of the big problems I've had with the, the pre-metastatic niche idea is that for whatever reason, the cancer cells, let's say they're sitting in the prostate. They have to, you know, they put out their, their garbage EVs. They go throughout the body for sure. And for some reason, some endothelial cells in the bone pick that up. And um, uh, they, they then have a place where cancer cells may preferentially go. But at the same time, there's no way that the cancer, the primary tumor population, could know about that niche um, where it is per se, just biologically, you can't do that circuit and get that. But um, so I do think that it's a tremendous uh, window into uh, to learn about um, how cells connect uh, across a timeline, you know, across evolution and why they're doing that or, or not why they're doing it, how it happens. Uh, but I also share great uh, with you, you know, great um, enthusiasm for uh, them diagnostically because uh, they're they are so sensitive to to study that contents. I'm sorry, that was a long, long soliloquy. Just to let me follow up. So the uh, traditionally uh, Darwinian thinking about the semantical evolution, they're always thinking each of the cell is isogenic, I mean, pretty much the same. So therefore, that population open to the axis of gene frequency change. So that's all the, you know, uh, so the population genetics based upon. So now they had a big problem because right now we found the multiple genomic and the lung genomic change. For example, right now, one of the very hot areas is so uh, you know, cellular particle condensing, even without a membrane. They also change the genetic information. Like when RNA splicing, different environment, they have different contents there. So they have different pattern of protein inside, even without a membrane. So they actually redefine the information context. So that's what we're talking about. So now we know, besides the chromosome difference, copy number difference, gene mutation difference, epigenetic difference, they have many topological differences within the cell, like not just the, the vesicle, but without membranes, they have certain condensed, so-called 
in a different area into the cell. And even so, is after chemotherapy, the normal cell actually can get the cancer cells DNA and then they also become the problem. So this is a huge of the ecosystem as a such, they all involved. So right now there is a one problem is every time if you focus on one stuff, you, you write a beautiful story had correlation with diseases, just like I, you know, we discussed with our colleague, if he studied mitochondria, always use mitochondria as a marker to tell, you know, the cancer, non-cancer, right? So every time everyone, People use telomere that tell the big story. People use gene mutation tell the story. We use the chromosome instability to tell the story. So the evolutionary biomarker actually should monitor the population of the cell growing, which is extremely difficult. So one of the challenge question is this, like in the embryogenic, they also have lots of chromosomal change, gene mutation change, but the system can handle it, no problem. But why when people getting old, the population, they have this, you know, the outlier and then they become dominant. So those actually is really challenging for us to thinking, what's the difference between early embryogenic dynamics and the late dynamics, the outlier actually hide the chance. So that's, uh, you know, one of the key questions we need to think about. Well, we've got a question from Paul here, which is, Jim, in your book, Evolution, A View from the 21st Century, you lamented how hard it is for many biologists to adopt new ideas. And you even said that you'd prefer to work with someone with a physics background rather than a background in biology because it's easier for them to get up to date with new developments in the field. Do you have any examples of this? Um, well, uh, but before I wrote the book, I, I, I studied uh, pattern formation by bacteria, by multicellular bacterial populations. And uh, the people I found most interested in, in the patterns that we observed and in, in interpreting them were solid state physicists. And uh, they were interested in it. The microbiologists have, have now become interested in it because we recognize how important it is in, in, in disease and all other aspects of, of, of bacteriology. But at the time it was the physicists who, who were interested in that. I, I think part of the problem is, in a, this goes back to our discussion on, on how to deal with uh, neo-Darwinism, uh, is uh, people get educated with what to think, but also what not to think. And we we're facing a problem, uh, uh, people like Ken are facing a problem of people who've been taught what not to think and saying, you, you can't do research which goes outside of these boundaries. And that's always a, 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 an unfortunate situation to be in. So I, I think it's, it's, uh, it, it's always nice to have people like Paul Davies, for example, come into, into the field and bring a fresh perspective without having been educated in, in the old way of thinking uh, because they have more freedom to, to incorporate new, new results and new ideas. Paul, I hope that answered your question. Henry, do you have a comment? I, I, I have some of the historic aspect. So when Anne, Many years ago, organized a uh, 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 thinking tank about the uh, cancer evolution, right? And initially, I mean, the, the, the get the, like including Paul, all this physics and the mathematician, all these people together to identify the problem of the, so what's the problem for cancer? So uh, those lung cancer bio, the scientists uh, said, Oh, of course, evolution is a big question in the field. Why you guys do not study evolution, right? So they also have another question is the information theory. So they actually identify few, three of them. And that's actually initiated the, you know, the NCI that discuss the evolution. So that's because suggested by physics and the mathematician. So you can see that they said that, I mean, biologists actually the, the forgot the forest because we just, uh, study each of the molecular pathway, we forgot, we forgot the evolution. 
yeah, that's uh, interesting. One, one of the, the big problems I think that we confront is that people want to reduce the explanation to a, an oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene or some combination of those. And without taking into account that we're dealing with a very complex system, which has many features, and we need to understand the the the, uh, the whole, the system as a whole, and think of it as a system, which, uh, as Henry pointed out very well in his book, uh, in biology, uh, complex systems have heterogeneity, and that gives them a certain kind of stability and robustness. And uh, rather than thinking that there's only one answer to the cancer problem, to realize that the tumors, especially when they get to be very dangerous, are complex, um, I don't know what to call them. Uh, I don't want to call them organisms, but complex biological entities. And uh, we need to take that complexity into account and not try and, and oversimplify. I also have one quick, quick question. So for Jim, and the, so if you're talking about the active evolutionary selection, so the activity, if you compare, you think the bacteria is, is much more the animal and the, the plants because the, the uh, you know, the bacteria without a, you know, sexual reproduction constraint. So they just, uh, you know, every individual bacteria is fundamentally different. Well, uh, I, I don't, I, you, uh, the activity I'm, I'm talking about and that I'm interested in is how, how organisms and cells change their genomes. Uh, I think that the, 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 it's, the, it's innovation is much more important than selection in evolution. So it's not on the, on the selection side of things that, uh, that I'm, I'm emphasizing that. Bacteria do this in, in different ways than the new karyotes do. And um, I focused for the meeting on, 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 on eukaryotes. We can talk about uh, bacterial evolution, if you will. It uses some of the same tools. There are transposable elements in bacteria, but it uses other tools like transmissible plasmids, which don't seem to play much of a role in, um, in eukaryotic evolution. But bacteria also make uh, micro, exo, micro vesicles, exosomes, and they trade information that way. And um, so I, I think the same thing is true that, uh, that bacteria have the capacity to change their genomes in certain ways. And they do, and we see that reflected in, in the way bacterial evolution takes place and how bacteria respond to things like starvation. I remember one of the uh, uh, experiments I did back in the 80s was uh, looking at a certain genetic fusion taking place. Uh, and I, I was interested in the process because um, the, one of the papers says it took two or three weeks for the colonies to appear. And I said to a student of mine who was using this technique at the time, why does it take so long? You should study that. And after telling him he should study it for, for uh, uh, many months, I finally decided to do the experiment myself. And I learned that starvation gives the cells the ability to make the fusion. But if you don't starve the cells, they won't make it. So, um, and that's similar to what happens with eukaryotic cells as well. If you starve them, you trigger uh, genetic instability or, or the formation of polyploid cells. And um, uh, then they can change uh, by, uh, 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 aberrant cell division processes. So all organisms have, the, have, have the, this uh, active capability of changing themselves. Uh, I, I wrote a paper recently on, on cognition in cells and I looked at uh, uh, um, mycoplasmas, which are the cells with the smallest genomes down to 580 some base pairs. And it turns out that a large fraction of their DNA are things like transposable elements, recombinases, CRISPRs, restriction and modification systems. They have very little DNA, but a great 
fraction of it is devoted to making change. And they also uh, engage in a lot of sexual change, which is different from that the, the, that we usually see in the laboratory with things like E. coli. It's not well understood, but we know that it occurs. And, and uh, it, it just says that even for the simplest living organisms, the simplest cells, uh, the ability to change your genetics is a fundamental property. And I think that's uh, one of the important things that uh, uh, we should keep in mind when we're thinking about evolution. William, I saw your hand. Do you have a comment on this subject? Yes or no, you can nod your head or shake it. William Cole, yes. Okay, are you having trouble unmuting? Okay, am I unmuted now? Perfect. Hi, okay, sorry. Uh, hi, Jim. The, um, so in my studies, um, I, I, and somewhat limited, I, I, I saw the evolutionary causes to be disabling of apoptosis and uh, DNA repair in the cell cycle. Um, and that to me will cause quite a bit of havoc when cells continue to replicate. I'm just wondering for either you or Henry, what your thoughts are and is, is what is going beyond, what is going on beyond that? Well, uh, uh, obviously, uh, upsetting the cell cycle and the cell division <laughs> and repair processes is part of becoming highly, uh, uh, uh variable as some cancer cells do. Um, but I've been amazed as, as I've been learning about cancer is, is how much built in ability there is to, to, to make changes and create new structures in the DNA and write new sequences. Uh, I've been uh, recently reading a lot of papers about DNA polymerase theta, which can make all kinds of changes, join pieces of DNA together, in, in, insert new sequences, which are not templated into the, into the genome. So I think that, that uh, the, the uh, boundary between what's, what's repair and what's uh, innovation, what's change is not clearly defined. And in fact, it's just two sides of the, of, of the same thing. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Uh... Yeah, well, we'll cer certainly, um metastasis is going to be uh going to be initiated uh and part of the cell cycle when there's hypoxia a hypoxia condition mm -hmm. do you agree and then so that will be something that's innovative that occurs but but the root cause appears to be disabling of apoptosis and uh and uh and repair maybe i, I don't know maybe so let me, let me just respond quickly. We, we see the loss of apoptosis and, and changes in control of the cell cycle and immortalization in, the, in cancer cells. But um, we don't know how they got there. And um, we have to find ways to, to identify cancer at earlier stages. So we can ask, are those features present or are they a consequence of, of some, some earlier events that we, we don't yet understand? So, I, I don't know people who do experiments uh, on, on say virally induced cancers or whatever, whether they have any, any insight into that process. That's, that's outside my realm of expertise. So uh, the, the, there is a paradoxical thing for the cancer is, is always paradoxical. So, for example, if you, the antibody, immune system, right, constrain the cancer, but under certain conditions, they're also actually treating the cancer become, you know, such a different. So, when we, we realize that when we trigger the apoptosis pathway, usually people say, oh, this is good. Yes, for majority of cells, the limit it's very good. But the also, many cells cannot finish the process and then the, in the repair system or killing system become create 
of the new system. So that is very paradoxical, right? So just to answer the question, because people always doing the experimental cancer research, they say, oh, we have the massive cell death, bingo. But that massive death eliminates the average population, but they push the outlier to become success. So that's the difficult part of this whole puzzle. Well, we've got a question from Doru, but I want to make sure that we are ready to move on to a new topic. So if anyone else has any comments on the previous topic, please speak up. Okay, so um, Doru said, Perry mentioned a paper of yours called All Living Cells Are Cognitive. Can you please comment on this statement? And do you have a reference for this paper? Uh, it's going to come out in biochemical and biophysical research communications. They're publishing a special uh, uh, issue on rethinking cognition. And basically what the, the paper says, tries to demonstrate is how uh, all living cells are cognitive. They carry out cognitive operations. And I was looking at the mycoplasmas with these cells with small genomes to see what they could recognize. And for example, they have CRISPR systems. Uh, we know a lot about CRISPRs because of the Nobel Prize this year and because of it's so popular in genetic engineering. But what a CRISPR system is, is a library which allows bacteria and allows mycoplasmas to read the DNA of infecting viruses and, and other DNA molecules which come into the cell. So it's a sensing system. And also they're activated by, by virus infection. So um, that's an example of what I meant by cognition, that we see it operating down at the, at the level, even of the simplest cells. And if it works in the simplest cells, it's going to work in more complex cells as well. And uh, this is not a new idea. Uh, there are some pretty old references to uh, microbial uh, 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 sensitivities and, and perceptions and, and responses to things like light, uh, bacteria swimming towards food or chemicals called chemotaxis. Uh, there are all kinds of processes like, like it. That's what the paper is. If you send me an email, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a, a PDF of it. Thank you very much. It was really uh, very clear. Thanks a lot. I will send you an email. Thank you. Okay. Good. Thank you, Doru. Uh, Paul would like to know, would you please say a bit about more, a uh, bit more about the unacknowledged pioneers in the field of biology whose ideas have been overlooked because they do not line up well with the neo-Darwinian paradigm, such as Richard Goldschmidt, Bar Barbara McClintock, Stebbins, Conrad Waddington, uh, Waddington, Roy Britton, Carl Woese, Lynn Margulis and Stephen J. Gold. Yeah, well, Richard Goldschmidt um, uh, was a, a, a Drosophila geneticist uh, in Germany, and then he had to leave because of the rise of Nazism, and he moved to Berkeley. And in 1940, he gave a series of lectures at Yale, which he publishes the book called The Material Basis of Evolution. And in that book, he the first half of the book is about microevolution, and the second half of the book is about macroevolution. And people haven't paid attention to that book the way they should. If they think of Goldschmidt at all, it's for his idea of hopeful monsters, which was that, to say that changes in developmental processes could lead to major changes in phenotype, and that would be an important step in, in evolution. Uh, Barbara McClintock discovered uh, all kinds of things. Um, I, I was just writing about uh, some tumor cells rearranging their uh, genomes using uh, retrotransposable elements. And part of it is that these elements can begin something called breakage fusion bridge cycle, which Barbara McClintock published on in 1939. So she had been just studying the chromosomes of maize but it was a, really a, a pioneer of cytogeneticists, cytogenetics and understanding how organisms um, 
handle their chromosomes. And it was actually through those studies uh, when she asked what happens when uh, a maize plant gets two broken chromosomes, what happens to it, that she discovered transposable elements. So, uh, and, and she had no reason to expect transposable elements, but they showed up and she figured out what they were. Uh, Stebbins, as I mentioned, discovered that when you cross two closely related species, you get genome instability and you can often get a new species formed very quickly. This has actually been observed in the Galapagos Islands by Rosemary and Peter Grant uh, when a, 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 a Darwin finch from one island made it with a, a finch from a different group, different species on another island and created a third species. So um, that's very important. Conrad Waddington wrote about, uh, uh, did a lot of different things, but his main thing that people remember him for now is, is uh, the fact that cells have epigenetic control over their genomes. Epigenetic just means in addition to genetics. And the information in the genome is not just the DNA sequence, it's also in the way that the DNA is bound up with histones, for example, and the way it's formatted either to, to not be transcribed or be transcribed, to replicate or not replicate. And, and Waddington was the real pioneer in that area. Uh, Roy Britton uh, discovered repetitive DNA um, just by doing uh, uh, molecular reassociation experiments when he found that the DNA from complex organisms reassociated much faster than the DNA from simple organisms like bacteria. And that indicated that there were many copies of the same sequence in that DNA. And that's where we first learned about repetitive DNA in the genomes of complex organisms. Uh, Carl Bose, of course, discovered a whole part of life that we didn't know existed, archaea. Uh, it's uh, half of the pre-eukaryotic world. Uh, it may be close to half of all of life as we know it. Uh, we only learned about archaea in 1977. Um, so uh, it's fairly recent. And uh, we should, that just tells us that very big things can be learned uh, uh, quite unexpectedly. Uh, the discovery of archaea, however, has made it possible to be sure that symbiogenesis was the origin of eukaryotes about 2 billion years ago, because we can trace back parts of the eukaryotic cell to archaea and parts of it to bacteria. And uh, it was a bacteria be becoming a symbiont in an archaeal cell that was one of the precursors of, of modern day, of, of all eukaryotes actually. Um, Lynn Margulis was a, a champion of the symbiogenetic theory of, of uh, evolutionary processes and uh, a keen observer. And she also had some very interesting ideas uh, about the nature of the biosphere together with uh, James Lovelock, uh, that the biosphere is a complex interactive system, which means it maintains itself many orders of magnitude sometimes out of uh, equilibrium. So for example, the fact that the atmosphere is 20% oxygen is uh, completely out of chemical equilibrium. Without active photosynthesis and oxygen production, uh, we wouldn't have that. Uh, and of course, without the 20% oxygen in the atmosphere, many organisms on earth, including ourselves, wouldn't be able to live. Um, so both in, in her emphasis on symbiogenesis and also on the, inter the interactive nature of the biosphere, uh, Lynn Margulis was an important figure. And Stephen Jay Gould was the person who pointed out that the fossil record actually is punctuated and not continuous as theory predicted. And uh, people often would say, well, that's because we just don't have all the fossils we could possibly have. But we know now that evolution can happen in a punctuated fashion. So um, uh, his, his contribution is important there. And I think that covers everybody. Uh, I, uh, I would like to add that uh, the uh, important people that uh, Jim mentioned were very, uh, 
let's say, important in the history of uh, genetics and epigenetics. But in the field of cancer, I think that the, a, a figure that has not been really recognized is David Smithers, who in 1962 published in uh, uh, Lancet a, a, an article called The Attack on Cytologism that unfortunately it has not been, let's say, recognized as a pioneer, even by the British uh, scientists. He used to work at the, the Royal Marsden and he was a hated person because he spoke clearly and he ridiculed uh, very with the, let's say, elegance of uh, British speakers, the lack of uh, uh, sense of what he called cytologism, which was reductionism at early age in 1962, but uh, nobody paid attention. We are publishing a paper on him uh, in the next couple of weeks that uh, uh, puts him in, in the map. Mm. Thank you. I'll have to look him up. I'll send you a copy. Okay, please. Doru would like to know, um, would you consider the meta metastatic disease a condition due to blind evolution or rather a finely regulated developmental program gone astray? Do you see metastasis as a random event, a non-random event, or maybe a combination of both? Well, um, I I have a, a difference with, with, with Henry here, which I could discuss, uh, which is uh, Henry calls the, the rapid change in the genome, genome chaos. And uh, I, I, I'm not, that, that implies that everything sort of happens at random, stochastically. Um, and when I look at changes in cancer, I see the operation of systems which have been there a long time in, in eukaryotic evolution. So I don't think they're, they're stochastic. Now we always have to ask in evolution, why do complex changes come out right? Is there anything that biases them towards uh, functionality? And uh, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think it's by defining the way uh, uh, organisms change themselves and then studying those processes, we'll be able to get answers. And I think uh, Perry actually, Perry Marshall, uh, uh, hinted at that in his talk about communication systems and coding systems. That there has to be some sort of um, um, coherence to them. And uh, it may be that, that uh, the way cancer cells change is not uh, is completely random as the term chaos, genome chaos would suggest. Um, and we have to start to do research that is well designed to show whether changes are, are, are chaotic or not. Because there are some changes which happen very, very regularly under certain conditions. Yeah, I, I'd like to explain uh, just a few words, Jim. So, so the genome chaos, this chaos, actually is not talking about completely random, right? Because initially when people define this idea, it's kind of emerging from the disorder to order. So why, the, why this process is actually quite uh, interesting is because in the normal situation, the carry type is actually maintain the system stable, that never change, but under the crisis and all the stress, they immediately just create so many different stuff, but you can think it is different information identity. So that's the thing. So therefore, that's why we're talking about the, the, the physics actually talking about chaos is a deterministic process. There's the actual rather say it's completely random. So some of the, uh, you know, the funding of the uh, chaos theory, the people that even said, they said, okay, I, if I use genome chaos, 
the people were misunderstood this is totally random, but actually the thinking is a deterministic process with many random elements. So how I explain this um, in the way? So, yeah. Go ahead, William. Yeah, so I, I did a little study of uh, metastasis around low blood levels of vitamin D and how that might upregulate metastasis. And what I found was that um, uh, the VEGF um, process is being upregulated uh, with low levels of vitamin D. So that would mean kind of both, if, if I'm right, both, both Henry and James are right to some degree, that it's the upregulation of a of a natural pathway because cells need ox need oxygen at times and need less oxygen at times. So upregulating that pathway would uh, would be would seem to form in a cancer cell because as you get these conglomeration of cells together, many of those cells could be starving for oxygen, and so that would uh, upregulate this pathway and. Uh, and then, uh, and then that that's a natural pathway that exists in the cells, but its upregulation is not in a natural form because it's in a cancer cell. They also attract uh, uh, vascularization. That's right. Blood vessels, which will give them a, 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 a supply of oxygen. That's right. So it's it's a definite pathway, but but to, to kind of to Henry's point, it is reacting randomly once the thing goes out of regulation. I think another argument towards the deterministic uh, mm -hmm. mechanism is related to the um, fact that metastases that don't seem to have, in general, additional mutated genes, they don't have to function, you know, with additional uh, genes that are mutated, but are more like, you know, really epigenetic process that it's uh, happening and it's modulating the function of genes. So it seems really like um, a process that uh, has a deterministic component. And of course, you can discuss about deterministic chaos; it would be a possibility. But um, as a clinician, if you're looking at, uh, for example, that prostate cancer, it tends to go, you know, mainly to the bones if it's not uh, a rare variant like small cell cancer of the prostate or something like that that has a different behavior. Or if you're looking at um, head and neck cancers, they have to, they tend to go uh, and metastasize in the lymph nodes. Um, and uh, if you're looking at lung cancer, you have uh, brain metastatic uh, metastasis happening. So if you look at uh, cl clinically, if you're looking from this part of the traffic jam and not from the combustion engine, uh, it seems to be some type of regularity in the behavior of uh, cancer at the microscopic level. So um, as a clinician, uh, I would really uh, clearly say that there is a component of uh, determinism in what, how the, the cancers behave. Uh, may I ask a question to Ken? that relates to this. Yes? Okay. Sure. Um, can I, you, you find normal cells in, in blood that uh, are uh, slough off from all tissues. And when you look for these uh, liquid biopsies, for example, and in the cases, that is true for the cases of uh, 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 metastasis as well as uh, what people want to call uh, cancer biomarkers, you find normal cells among the cancer cells, right? So if you um, look at um, uh, blood circulate uh, and look for circulating cells um, with uh, that have epithelial markers saying that they came from some kind of tissue. Um, the only, the, the cell, uh, a normal cell is extremely rare compared to a cancer cell. And the cells that you do find in the blood tend to be uh, bone marrow progenitors. Um, it's, it, you don't see, for example, uh, a liver cell floating around. Um, but normal. No, not a normal one, no. Um, no, no, no. I mean, those from uh, the bone marrow. Yeah, the, so you do see some, um, um, uh, the only cells that, that we, you routinely pick up in, a, in circulation 
um, are either from uh, bone marrow uh, um, and, and you'll get some pro progenitor leakage there. So some like some endothelial precursors, um, but you, you don't see um, uh, uh, normal cells from other organs. Well, this is at least in what I read, these people have found, and this is one of the problems with the so-called biomarkers in this liquid biopsy, is that they find normal cells with, without, I mean, by normal, I mean non-mutated cancer uh, driver uh, genes in them. So that, was, that is a complication to uh, uh, consider that uh, liquid biopsies will give us uh, an idea about uh, metastasis or biomarkers, is that correct? So, so I don't, um, uh, I, I don't believe that that's correct. I think the, those cells are so extremely rare uh, that I'm not um, saying I'm not saying that they are the majority. I'm saying that no, that that the the fact that they mobilize and end up in the blood is not a, let's say, an unusual thing. This is it, all It I is think. an unusual. No, I, I would disagree. I, I do think it's an unusual thing, but I also don't believe that circulating tumor cells are sensitive enough, uh, of a, a sensitive enough assay to find an early cancer um, that is, is still localized. Um, using, you know, the best techniques possible right now, which are, are pretty darn good, you cannot find um, cir uh, circulating tumor cells uh, in most uh, small localized cancers. Um, you can when they're metastatic, um, but uh, we've studied this extensively in prostate and um, I spent a lot of time talking to Peter Kuhn, who uses a non-selective method um, for determining circulating tumor cells. And it is just, they are very, 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 very rare in primary uh, tumors. I, do, I think that the, the methods that will work in these early tumors are gonna be, uh, you do see um, um, you know, exosomes and microvesicles that are, are different. Um, even um, uh, cell-free DNA um, uh, is probably not sensitive enough, although those assays may get sensitive enough to find it, but that, will, that situation will get complicated by normal, quote-unquote, uh, because um, no, as cells die, they release their DNA into the circulation. So I, uh, I think there's, um, that's, what, that, that's why I think uh, extracellular vesicles are currently likely the best scenario for finding the, the early tumors. We've got a question from Paul here. Um, I'm sorry, Doru, you came on. Did you have a comment on that? Yes, just a, just a very brief comment. So um, I agree with Kenneth on this. Um, and I will also add that probably the metabolomics from the blood, they can also detect uh, early cancers. Um, in Lyon, France, uh, there is this uh, center of epidemiology where they uh, have been following uh, patients longitudinally uh, through time and uh, taking blood, you know, year by year. And then uh, when they develop cancer, they can go back and analyze the data. And they found that um, uh, early, uh, you know, changes in uh, metabolites in the blood, they can be associated, in fact, with uh, early detection. And uh, uh, this uh, is true, for example, for uh, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer. So um, together with exosomes, it's possible also that uh, the metabolites that can be useful for that purpose. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. That's true. Uh, I acknowledge that you don't disagree, but the literature claims that precisely one of the problems in cancer is that there are very few biomarkers or there are no biomarkers. In other words, you cannot claim that you have a biomarker of cancer, I understand. Is that true, uh, Paul? I was not discussing about a biomarker of cancer, but you know. This is what we are discussing. No, 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 so wait a second. My opinion is that cancer is not a disease only of the cell, but it's also a disease of the tissue and the disease of the whole organism. 
So what you're detecting in blood is not really the cancer itself. You're not going to detect DNA of the cancer cell, but you're going to detect changes that are you know, preparing the cancer to appear. So before you have the clinical cancer appearing, the organism itself in which cancer appears is not a normal organism. It's an organism where the cancer can develop. It's like uh, you know, the soil. In order for the seed to grow in the soil, the soil has to be modified. So the soil is not going to be normal in order to have cancer. You have the immune system modified, you know, to allow that, uh, you know, uh, cancer cells to develop and the tissue is going to be also uh, modified. So what you're going to find, but what uh, Ken was saying is that if you're looking at the exosome, exosomes are not only coming from the tumors, but they also come from the rest of the tissue and they're modified before the cancer appears and early, early on, er early in the development of cancer. Uh, I have one more question, sorry. So the, the for Jim and the Dennis, because uh, for uh, recent years, we discussed with uh, the new idea from cancer, we learned to the evolutionary biologist. So the, the universally actually, for example, I talked to, if I talked to 50 of them, 48 of them told me, cancer is weird. Anything you learn from cancer cannot apply to the evolutionary theory. So this is a common, this idea. Only recently they have two people that actually, this actually hardcore evolutionary biologists, they're thinking that actually makes sense, this data from the cancer, right? So how should we move forward with the you know, information from Ken, from all these people to communicate with the people, the hardcore of evolution? Do you have any you know, suggestions? Well, I, I think the idea to, to publish uh, summaries of the conference and point out the various places where evolutionary thinking uh, illuminates cancer and where cancer studies illuminate evolution uh, will be a good way to, to, to do that. And hopefully we can get that information in the hands of both uh, evolutionists and cancer biologists and help them come come together and 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 look at both processes in a a, a synergistic fashion there's one question here from paul yes james you pointed out that in the neo-darwinian modern synthesis changes are attributed to random mutations, accidents, and natural selection. The organism needs simply reproduce, it is otherwise passive. Whereas active evolution involves a number of processes discovered since the 1940s, modification due to viruses, horizontal evolution, sharing of DNA, symbiogenet symbiogenetic, natural genetic engineering, ability of cells to change their genome, niche construction, the idea that organisms can modify their environment. Which ideas do you think are the most important ones holding back biologists currently involved in the cancer research and students who are coming into the field? Uh, all the above. I, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to choose between, between any of these things. I think if you, if you start to research on any topic, you have an open mind and uh, some imagination, you're going to find things that are completely uh, unexpected. And that's certainly been the history of, of, uh, of genetics, and I'm sure it's also the history of cancer biology. Um, uh, it's the things that we, that we don't know about uh, that we, we learn uh, that are new that are going to help us solve some of the problems we face uh, currently. So we can't predict where this interaction between cancer biology and evolution will lead. Uh, all we can say is that uh, pursuing it, we'll find out things which will turn out in the end to be useful to us. And uh, I think the most important thing is just to keep an open mind. And I think that's the perfect place for us to end this Q&A session. Thank you all so much for being actively participating in every single one of these sessions. I've seen so many of your faces multiple times and you, you know, your contributions to this have been absolutely invaluable and I can't thank you more 
for being a part of this. Um, unfor it's unfortunate that Perry, my dad, couldn't be a part of all of these, but trust me, he is going to be thrilled at the dialogue that's happened. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jim, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Well, thank you, Donna. Of course. For moderating so, so, so elegantly. I appreciate that, but it's really been my pleasure, like I said. So thank you all so much, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Uh, we will see you on Thursday for, um, oh, it's not Matthias Mann, for Michael Levin's Q&A session. Right. Thank you all so much. See you soon. Bye.